My title comes from a Yiddish adage that throws light on a perennial aspect of the human condition, which is the topic of my address this morning. The proverb I'm referring to is der Mensch tracht und Gott lacht, okay, which translates into man plans and God laughs. This bit of wisdom is actually found in many cultures, and it sort of spurred my curiosity, and I did sort of a search to find out different cultures that basically have proclaimed the same sort of wisdom. No sooner did the title for this talk get out than Janet Glass, Janet's here, Janet Glass emailed me with the Spanish near equivalent, el hombre propone y Dios, Dios dispone, which is that, it sort of rhymes, man proposes and God disposes. However, I looked a little bit further and I found that Thomas Akempis, who was a 14th, 14th century uh, Catholic theologian, had in Latin exactly the same phrase. And it's not clear as to whether the Spanish, medieval Spanish, preceded Thomas Akempis' insight or whether it was the other way around. The second century, but the idea goes all the way back, the second century uh, Roman playwright, second century BCE, Roman uh, playwright Plautus had written, Sperit quidam animus, quote, eveniat dis in manu est. I was a Latin major and I have to look for every opportunity to use it, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> which means, whatever the mind may hope for, that which happens is in the hands of the gods. Okay, similar idea. And there's also a, a reference, actually, I found maybe the oldest one, that goes back to Homer's Iliad, where Achilles is sulking in his tent over the death of his friend, young friend, Patroclus, and um, he makes some statement to the effect that I had certain ambitions and so on, but the gods had other plans for me and so on, which may be the oldest reference to that insight, maybe there are older ones. And then Lucy Lettuce, who's like, where's Lucy? She's also yeah. here, right, but here she is, right, she also couldn't resist, and when she saw the announcement of the talk, uh, it sent me a stanza from a Robert Burns poem that she herself had recently recited at a gathering to the effect that, quote, but mouse friend, you are not alone, and proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go oft awry and leave us only grief and pain. Okay, end quote. So there's a type of universality to that insight that I sort of is the launching point for my address this morning. But uh, given Robert Burns' insight, I would say maybe, maybe, maybe grief and pain are not the only possible responses <laughs> to this existential condition we find ourselves in. And that opens sort of a gate to my exploration this morning. I should note that those humanists who are militant atheists and think that God should never be invoked in the magisterial halls of ethical culture, except to argue that he doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm, I have to be clear that I'm employing God as a metaphor, as a stand-in for the larger reality that envelops us and to which we need to accommodate ourselves and which ultimately will have the last word. Or perhaps for those who believe in it, and it's a difficult concept, we can understand God as fate, which governs our destiny, but fate, unlike God, is usually understood to be disinterested and impersonal. I want to start with a word about humor. Philosophers and psychologists have taken humor very seriously. Uh, you can look at Schopenhauer, Immanuel Kant, who is probably the most unfunny of all possible thinkers, uh, and in fact wrote about humor. Uh, Schopenhauer did, as well as many basically 18th century Enlightenment figures and others, and uh, psychologists have as well, and they've long theorized about humor and what it is exactly that makes something funny. I mean, why do human beings have a sense of what stimulates our sense of humor? One theory speculates that humor results from one's stance of superiority over others. We laugh at others when we can look down on them. The most salient kind of humor uh, of this type is what the Germans refer to as schadenfreude, that rather unadmirable un emotion wherein we feel joy at the misfortune of others. Okay, I mean, I think we all experience it, but it's not an emotion we can feel particularly proud of, I think. And I personally don't find this theory of humor very compelling, and to the extent to which it does explain causes for humor, it does so, I think, in a very limited number of cases, and I would say fortunately so. A second theory of humor is what's known as the relief theory. By this light, humor results from the relief 
of bodily tension and the, uh, basically the expression of nervous energy. Sigmund Freud actually appropriated this notion and analyzed this theory in a book which he wrote, on not one of his best books, called Jokes and the Unconscious. Uh, they wrote a book on jokes. I don't know why all these Germans are writing, uh, writing out humor, but uh, in effect wrote a book on jokes and the unconscious, and he adopts this notion saying that the relief very often we fear may go on on the unconscious level, not consciously. And again, my personal view is that this explanation uh, is of rather limited value. Far more compelling and comprehensive, I think, is the idea that humor results from the juxtaposition of incongruous ideas and scenarios. Incongruity, I think, is the key to much humor. We often find things funny when reality defies our expectations or totally incongruous things present themselves in proximity to each other. Jokes, when they work, and I think stand-up comedians know this very well, often do so because the punchline defies the expectation that the comedian then works to set up prior, and then the expectation is something altogether different, and we find the juxtaposition of that incongruity to be funny. Or we can find things visually funny when they defy our assumptions of what should assumedly, different things that assumedly should go together. So if we're waiting for a friend to arrive, and he comes to the door wearing just a suit or a, share, a shirt and a pair of chinos, there's nothing funny about that. But if he comes to the door, for example, with a baby seal perched on his head, okay, we most likely would find this scenario preposterous, ludicrous, and in a word, humorous and funny. I know I certainly would if I encountered a friend with a seal bounced on his head. In short, humor partakes of concepts or images which are incongruous, illogical, and frankly speaking, absurd. When this incongruity is accompanied by surprise, we find the humorous element strengthened even more. I think having a sense of humor, personally, is one of the most delightful things about being human. I personally enjoy laughing a lot, and I would submit is a necessary element in enabling us to navigate through life and cope with its hardships and misfortunes, which no doubt are inevitable. I suspect that a sense of humor and laughter is actually inborn and that we witness it in very small children, even before they become verbal. And I know I often find it funny and amusing to watch a very funny child break out in laughter over something. I mean, it just shows that the capacity for humor, it's got to be sort of hardwired into the human condition, which I think is just a lovely thing about us. I don't know other species. I don't think fish and amphibians and reptiles laugh very much, but uh, human beings do, and I think it's something really a nice feature about the human condition. So, this is the beginning. Humor is the beginning of the end point of what I want to share with you. Uh, the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard had once said, that, quote, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. End quote. We humans can know the past with often a strong degree of certainty, and I suspect that few people worry or feel anxious about past events or things that they themselves, themselves had experienced in the past. It's over. We may be upset about past events, but since they are behind us, there is nothing to anticipate or feel insecure about, and so we generally don't review the past with anxiety. We, review, we look at the future with anxiety, but nobody feels particularly anxious about what is already gone. But looking ahead, the future faces us with unknowns and uncertainty, which often is a cause for insecurity and anxiety and sometimes fear. Fear is often tagged to something specific that we can, to some degree, anticipate. But anxiety, I think, is an emotion which is more free-floating, often does not have a definitive target, and relates to a future which has built into it a great deal of ambiguity which we cannot control or readily organize with our thoughts. Protracted anxiety is simply intolerable and requires that it be quelled and overcome as greatly as possible. I mean, we can endure anxiety for a little bit, but if it goes on and on, it becomes an emotion which clearly we have to escape. We cannot endure anxiety for long periods of time. To the extent that the future is uncertain and unknown, and it always is, fear and anxiety always looms as possibilities. Individual human beings, as well as civilization as a whole, are pushed ahead by many dynamics. 
Certainly the fulfillment of basic needs in is a great motivator of human activity and creativity. We are creatures of need. But beyond that, many people are motivated by curiosity, ambition, aggression, and the yen for exerting their power and domination over others. But I would argue that human beings, both individuals and society as a whole, are motivated to do things in order to overcome anxiety. And we do this by striving to build greater certainty into an uncertain and ultimately unknown future. And we do this through engaging our intelligence in the service of actively planning for the future by making the unknown known and thereby familiar to us. In looking ahead and planning for the future, we seek to overcome our needs and gain greater comfort and equanimity until we are confronted with new problems and unknowns, which we perpetually are, and on and on it goes in a never-ending cycle. Another way to structure this is to say that we humans are finite or limited creatures. We are limited in our strength, our knowledge, and our intelligence. At the same time, the reality we live in is infinite, and the future opens up to eternity. And so there is a perpetual gap between our abilities, however clever we think we are, and the mysteries we confront in time and space. We may look back with 2020 hindsight, but we can never look ahead with 2020 vision. Such is the existential human condition. We can understand the past, but we must work to construct the future. And there is a gap between reality, which is infinite, and our own limited capacities to know, and so on. Again, we are finite creatures riddled with imperfections. Different people value different things, and mutual understanding often seems so very difficult. We bicker and fight with each other, and human beings seem to have a perverse ability to compete and disagree with one another, sometimes for the sheer pleasure of asserting one's ego and being disagreeable. You know, uh, When I was a kid, and I sort of looked forward to a Marxist utopia, my assumption was that if everyone had their own pear tree, people would always be at peace, and no one would have to fight over pears, until I developed a more less benign view of human nature. And I concluded that there probably are some people who are so perverse who would want the pear that was going into your mouth simply because it was going into your mouth. And that human beings, in effect, there is an element of perversity that frustrates, ultimately, in some ways, a type of utopian notion of human cooperation and goodness. We humans have our faults and foibles. We stumble and fall, and as limited creatures, we often fail. Failure, again, is a product of our limitations. In this sense, I indeed, on the other hand, sometimes marvel at how we human beings have been able to accomplish anything at all in the service of maintaining, maintaining a cooperative society and building our civilization. And progressively, over 10,000 years, humanity indeed has accomplished quite a lot. But it's quite amazing, given the, the differences of people, the fact that people have different values, we have different cultures with different values that compete with each other, people are just disagreeable, and so on. And yet we have been able to construct together a collective project of building a civilization, and we are becoming more peaceful. Uh, fewer people starve, fewer people die in childbirth. We are the human, if you read Steven Pinker, you would say it's never been so good. Uh, indeed, human civilization is indeed improving. And there's a lot to be said, given the limitations and the flaws that I think are inherent in, in the human, human lot. But it is that, that gap between our intentions and plans on the one hand, and reality's ability to thwart and frustrate our most thoughtful and best laid plans that captures my imagination. And my talk is a reflection on how we can deal with that aspect of the human condition, that gap between our expectations and having them frustrated. There are three responses to the frustrations we experience that come to my mind when we make plans for the future as best we can and reality has other designs in store for us, so to speak. The first orientation, I think, is to feel overwhelmed and crushed by reality in the face of our best efforts, at least initially. I usually like to divide the problems we confront and frustrations we bear into those which I personally call cosmic and those which are not cosmic. And I think it is useful to employ our powers of reflection to discern between the two. And indeed, sometimes when I get very upset with something, I actually stop and I reflect on it and I say, is this a cosmic problem? Or is it something that's not cosmic? And usually it's not cosmic, OK, usually. And that becomes a source of internal relative tranquility. And you go, 
through that exercise, because I really get upset about small things. But I must say, I'm not a Pollyanna. There is real tragedy in life. Indeed, the longer I live and the more lives that cross with mine, the more tragedy I encounter. We are prone, as we are, to great illness. Folks have children with serious problems that require their lifelong attention and care. Perhaps most of us will suffer the loss and grief of loved ones, and as mortal creatures we will all come to face our mortality and the realization that nature indeed will have the last word. In the face of tragedy, we all need to cope as best we can. Uh, we who are humanists need to borrow support and strength from our friends and our loved ones and through, through communities you know, such as this. We perhaps can cultivate the mindset in which we can wrest consolation and carve out moments of joy from the small, smaller sectors of life in the face of darker realities. Perhaps in extremis, we can adopt a stance of what I call, quote, stoic resignation, in which we recognize that we have struggled and planned as best and as hard as we can. And after we have done all that we possibly can do, we then open ourselves up to what is inevitable and necessary. We'll ye we yield ourselves to what is greater than we and which we cannot change. It's been said that, quote, freedom, freedom is the knowledge of necessity. And I believe that there's some consolation that comes with that understanding. There is freedom in lifting the burden of the inevitable from our shoulders and giving ourselves over, so to speak, to what is necessary and we cannot change. Stoic resignation. But there are realities that are not serious, grave, or cosmic but we often mistakenly assume or believe that they are. Missing a meeting because we're stuck in unexpected traffic, even though we've planned to leave on time, or heaven forbid, we've left our cell phone at home and have that sinking feeling, my God, I don't have my cell phone with me, and so on and so forth, even though we plan very hard and develop the habit of always carrying our cell phone, uh, we may indeed at that realization feel overwhelmed in the moment and our failures to live up to reality match and do, um, uh, we plan and our ability to realize those plans and intentions uh, do not materialize. But these are not cosmic issues by any means. It would do us well again to reflect on these small things and I think put them in their place uh, compared to a larger perspective. Life is riddled with failed, failed expectations and frustrations large and small, whether we fail a test, lose a job, or get dumped by a romantic partner. Bad things happen, whether we are, we are primarily the cause or for reasons that are beyond our control, or perhaps a mix of the two. One response is the power of, to the power of reality, which frust frustrates our plans, again, is to feel overwhelmed. And perhaps in those circumstances, we become too self-blaming, self-pitying, or perhaps even self-hating. Feelings overwhelmed with their own abilities, so self-impressed with their own intelligence, their talents, or their greatness, that they construe that they can triumph over reality, however overbearing it may be. Such folks are narcissists to the nth degree. They are supreme egotists who are blind to their own limitation. For such folks, nothing ever gets in the way. They are filled with a spirit of perpetual triumphalism. If they encounter failure, rather than introspecting and uh, taking a reckoning of their own limitations, they either deny them or externalize their failure and blame it on someone else, thus mitigating their own, their own sense of frustration. The Greeks had a word for this disposition and that's hubris. For the ancients, hubris is the concept of human beings defying the gods. It is assuming powers that it is not for human beings to assume. To commit hubris involves the act of simply going too far. It is to violate the laws of nature, and by so violating human beings' place in the scheme of things, one inevitably suffers a fall, which is the warp and woof of tragedy. Let me be philosophical for a moment. There are indeed religious thinkers, many, who have asserted that humanism, which is the worldview to which most of us subscribe, is guilty of some form of hubris. Why so? The contention is that humanism is a philosophy that asserts that human beings can triumph over all adversity. The allegation is that in denying the existence of a divine being, 
or at a minimum that people in society at large can adequately flourish in the absence of a supervening God, man has replaced God with himself. That's the criticism of religious criticism of humanism, that we have turned ourselves effectively into gods. This, to use the biblical term, is the ultimate form of idolatry, namely to assert or act as if the human being is the highest power in the universe. The correlate of this hubris is an expression of ultimate arrogance that opens the door to many excesses. It leads, in the first instance, to man assuming that he is supreme over nature and the environment and all that exists exclusively for his own benefit. It leads also to human licentiousness that knows no restraint. In other words, so the critique goes, unless human beings recognize that they live under a divine reality with divinely ordained moral principles, which people did not make, nor which can they unmake, then the field is wide open to all kinds of abuses of power. Remove God from the universe and leave human beings to their own devices, and what do you get? What you get are all kinds of humanly derived ideologies and social engineering schemes, such as Stalinism, Maoism, Pol Potism, and human tyranny without limit. Trumpism. What? Trumpism. Trump is, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I mean, thank you. Yes. That was in I the think that that's, the that's true. Right. That, you know, remove God and you get Donald Trump, right? <laughs> with human beings, with human beings assuming that they are the highest power in the universe, there is nothing to restrain them, and the results therefore become disastrous. For many religious minds, this is where humanism, atheism, and secularism must lead. Never mind. Never mind, we might say, all the evil perpetrated by those who asserted that God, their creator and master of the universe, was always on their side and gave his followers their divinely ordained marching orders to commit whatever evil they felt like committing, you know, doing away with the infidels and the unbelievers and so on. For such religious folks, religion is not the malefactor. Rather, it is the denial of a higher power which glories in human self-aggrandizement. Now, I might concede that this critique of humanism could have some validity, but I don't think it is a correct understanding of what humanism, in fact, proposes and what it's about. As I understand it, humanism does not profess that human beings are fully developed, superior beings who are arrogantly blind to the limitations of our own existence and our proper place in nature and in the scheme of things. Rather, humanism, as I understand it, professes that we are rather imperfect beings who strive for ideals and self-improvement while recognizing, therefore, that we will always fall short of those ideals. In other words, we human beings live in a state of potential rather than in a state of complete and flawless uh, actualization and achievement. We live under a recognition of our own limitations. We are not divine beings or quasi-divine beings, but perpetually flawed creatures who always strive for improvement because we recognize that we have very far to go. In other words, in humanist philosophy, I think, there's a built-in notion of humility and a sense of our expanding abilities, but abilities and powers that are always limited even as we strive to grow and expand. This segues into my last outlook on life. And that orientation is one that further chases the arrogance, hubris, and vanity of inflating our powers and abilities. At the same time, they serve to leaven and lighten the heaviness of self-denigration that may come when our best plans end up in failure. And that is to recognize what I have been weaving throughout this brief exposition of the human condition. That is, no matter how smart we are, no matter how meticulous we, we plan for the future, no matter how sincere our efforts, no matter how hard we try to create the results we desire for ourselves, that things can and often do turn out contrary to our best plans and efforts. Very often, reality has a way of making a mockery of our most seriously engaged endeavors. This happens because we ourselves are not all-knowing or as smart as we think we are, or all-wise. Nature and reality will always be more complex than we can anticipate. We are flawed and we are limited, and many things that frustrate our efforts that go unseen by us in advance. In short, bad things happen. If the universe were a giant jigsaw puzzle, we are like pieces that don't fit neatly or perfectly into the corners, into the picture as a whole. Our existential condition, as the adage stage, is such that in the face of our most sincere, deeply held efforts, 
in the face of our most meticulously crafted plans, in the face of our taking ourselves so seriously, God is looking down and laughing at us, I hope, but I hope gently so. He is aware of our foibles and is taking some delight in our misplaced vanity, in our pretensions, in our overextended expectations that success is in the cards for us when failure and frustration always loom as possibilities. He sees the incongru incongruity between human striving, <coughs> scheming, and planning, and the outcome of all that serious effort that falls short, and that incongruity causes him to laugh. Incongruity, again, is the basis for humor. And so, where can this assessment of the human condition lead, and what can we learn from it? Maybe we can look at ourselves and divest ourselves of our pretensions. Maybe for some who are committed to it, we can give up perfection as a standard to strive for. Maybe we can begin to add a little more levity to our lives. Maybe we can be appreciative of our limitations and become more accepting of ourselves in the face of those limitations. And as we do, maybe we can be less judgmental and harsh with the mistakes and failures of others. Maybe we can become less serious in the face of our failures and more relaxed with ourselves. Maybe we can recognize that falling short of our expectations is built into the human <coughs> condition, and when our best laid plans do go awry, our task is not to cry endlessly in our pillow, not to adopt a state of defeatism, but to pull ourselves up, learn from our mistakes, and then simply try again. And maybe if we can take this perspective, maybe if we can understand why God is laughing at our foibles, we can begin to take God's standpoint. In other words, maybe we can begin to join in the joke, take life less seriously, and in our mistakes, despite our best efforts, learn to laugh at ourselves. Thank you.